I will transition to our first speaker, who will be Ernie Bell, uh, presenting a talk entitled Terrestrial Lunar Analogs Field Geophysics Lessons for Lunar Surface Science Operations. And Ernie, I'll give you some verbal warnings when your time is at the six and eight minute mark. Go ahead, thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get the screen shared. So if I could just get a confirmation, I, everyone can see that. We can. Thanks. Okay, excellent. So, um, there we go. Uh, okay. Sorry, just moving the video out of the way. Um, so, afternoon, everyone. Uh, good to uh, be here and talk with everyone. Just want to recognize that this uh, work is actually uh, not just with uh, myself and University of Maryland. Um, it's also uh, work um, from NASA, folks at NASA Goddard, Goddard uh, Northern Arizona University, and uh, uh, all listed there at the bottom. Um, so we'll make sure you recognize everyone. So what we're looking at is uh, using geophysics um, in terrestrial lunar analogs and looking at it from a lunar surface science operational standpoint. So um, to start, um, back in Apollo, the uh, geophysical task types were essentially could be uh, grouped into two different types of tasks. This would be um, deployments, which are one uh, instruments that are put out and left. They are uh, set up one time. Things such as the Apollo 12 lunar surface experiment package, which had a multitude of various types of instruments that were deployed. Um, they included also the heat flow probes, um, also active seismic um, lines, such as the geophone line from Apollo 16. So that was one type of set of um, uh, tasks that were performed, geophysical tasks. The other could be grouped in a traverse type task where you took a reading at one point and then the crew would traverse to another point and take another reading. And this would either be on foot or uh, via the uh, lunar rover. And this could be things such as uh, magnetometry, which you see on the left of the screen there, a magnetometer, which was deployed, readings taken, and then uh, moved on to the next uh, location. Uh, gravimetry, such as the Apollo 17 crew member there in the middle or even uh, the lunar seismic profiling experiment of Apollo 17, where even though the geophones were set near the LEM itself, the um, explosive packages were actually deployed throughout the lunar rover traverse. So it's kind of a combination of the two actually, but the traverse was required in order to get to proper distances for the explosive packages. So um, we've performed a number of geophysical uh, studies in terrestrial analogs and the two field sites that uh, specifically I've looked at our San Francisco volcanic field, specifically around the SP crater, which is just north of Flagstaff. And um, it's, a, it's a volcanic field of a number of cinder cones. You can see a picture of it there in the lower left. And then the other location um, is Lava Beds National Monument, which is in Northern California and is a huge um, lava flow, multiple lava flows, cinder cones, and particularly has a wide range of lava tubes there, which we've done, or specifically I've been working on uh, magnetometry and um, surveys and things like that there. In the San Francisco volcanic field, it was uh, seismic surveys. So in the San Francisco volcanic field, we've done um, two different types of seismic surveys. Uh, one's kind of short geophone lines, about 115 meters. Other are longer uh, nodal lines of a kilometer in length. This is active seismic refraction. You can see some of the examples of the analysis here in the upper left is 1D refraction analysis. And below it is actually some 2D refraction analysis that we've done. Now the 1D was on the geophone lines and the 2D is on the one kilometer long nodal lines. And then in the Lava Beds National Monument, I've been performing uh, a number of surface um, area surveys, magnetic surveys over top of the lava tubes for a couple of years. And uh, you can see in the upper right, this is some of the resulting um, magnetic highs and lows, the lows being cool colors, the highs being more the, uh, the brighter colors that you see actually um, plotted over top of some of the, uh, a map of the actual, um, a topography of the actual uh, lava tube itself. And in the lower right, you see some results of um, some 3D modeling that was done using LIDAR. Um, some of the team members were doing that. And then how this results into observed. And then we were able to actually then model these anomalies that would be produced by the lava tubes themselves. So we were able to compare that. But I want to talk about how we would actually then use what we've learned in these um, geophysical field studies to now um, extend that to potentially the moon. And one of the first, uh, um, talk about some of the strategies that we would use. 
So you'd want to look at, first of all, what type of deployment was it going to be? Is this going to be a permanent or long-term type of installation, such as a seismometer? And you see examples on the moon and actually out in San Francisco volcanic field. Or is this more of a transitory type of use of instrumentation, such as magnetometry, where you have a magnetometer in the lower, lower left on the moon and then in the lower right that we used in uh, lava beds and moved it across an area? Oops. And yeah, had some things there. So then you look at from a mode standpoint, is this going to be a single point? Is this going to be a transect? In other words, a line? Or are we covering an area? So what type of mode do we actually want to perform the geophysical uh, study in? And this is to be expanded to any type of particular, any type of geophysical study, not one particular study, but what type of mode would we want to use? So a single point, a line, or over an area, essentially. And then the next step would be to determine what type of method. So we have, you know, how we're going to deploy, how long we're going to deploy the instrument, what type of survey needs to be done essentially. And then we want to know how do we want to do it. We want to do it just purely with the crew, which is A, and I'm using representations from sub uh, C uh, research and operations that are done um, routinely out in the oceans. So is it just a crew member that's executing it manually? Or B, do you have a robotically augmented crew ops, such as in this case, this is the Alvin submersible where the crew is there, but they're using robotic arms and things like to actually do the work outside. So they're assisted um, robotically. And there's ways to translate that. I'm sorry? Two more minutes. Oh, okay, great. So there's ways to translate that to a geophysical um, surveys on the earth and the moon. Or do you actually have a crew assisted robotic op where the crew sets up the robot and sends it off on its way, but they're there just for rescue or resupply, essentially a reconditioning of the robot, or is it telerobotically commanded type of operations? So let's, we also learned uh, several lessons from uh, the analogs that we've used. So from a planning standpoint, you want to know what the data density and what the aperture of the type of, for the type of geophysical study you want to do. You want to determine what type of deployment, mode, or method you want to use. And then these all get fed, fed into training for lunar operations. So and you can use terrestrial lunar analogs to provide the reality of this uh, field work in a training. And then for execution, what type of coordination needs to take place? Coordination of the instrument place and be placement between the crew and the ground here on Earth. What type of data evaluation needs to be taking place real time? And what type of operational lessons can we learn as far as, or provide as far as functionality verification? If there is an issue, what kind of support from the ground can we provide to the crew? So in conclusion, three main takeaways here would be, first of all, use the terrestrial analogs um, to, to evolve the Apollo era science operational strategies to include our modern technology to provide additional capabilities, essentially. And then use a matrix of deployment strategies, modes, and methods to op optimize what type of lunar surface science tasks and how they should be performed within the overall mission architecture. So you can optimize that um, based on those three types of things. And then integrate this into the task development from the beginning so that you're, it's included in the mission planning, training, and execution phases um, and using the terrestrial analogs to do this. So in conclusion, that's, uh, that's my talk. I appreciate you listening. Thank you so much, Ernie. And uh, that was eight minutes on the dot. Appreciate you. I haven't seen anything come through the chat so far. But are there any questions for Ernie at this time? Hearing none yet, uh, we'll jump in with one. Ernie, you uh, brought us some lessons learned and uh, hinted at some of the, the next generation work that's uh, going to come out of this research. What are some of the things that you're most excited about seeing come into play in future lunar exploration based on this work? I'm sorry, you came through just a little bit broken there. Can you please repeat the question for me? Sure thing. Yes, you uh, told us a little bit of, about some of the lessons that are being learned from this work and um, that it will play into next generation technology as that applies to linear exploration. But what are some of the outcomes that you're really excited about seeing come to fruition here based on your research? 
Okay, well, I, I think we can get uh, more extensive coverage. Um, you know, we had, Apollo was fantastic because it had um, you know, initial evaluation of the moon from a geophysical perspective, really. But now we can start looking at more of the details and optimizing the mission, especially with the longer missions. We can look at um, and potentially traverses. Um, how do we get true area surveys, potentially? Can we integrate the robotics? Robotics have really advanced a lot now, but they haven't necessarily advanced enough to stay parallel maybe with the humans, but there's a good uh, synergy, I think, that we can have between robotic operations and crude operations of the task, you know. And then we can use, you know, the, the work that we're doing in the terrestrial analogs to understand, okay, this might be a fairly crew intensive task if we have the crew do it, but it's going to be for a short duration. So that's a good trade-off versus maybe the more monotonous, repetitive type tasks that we could delegate to robotic operations and have the crew there to uh, fill in. But one of the things I think could be really interesting is that you know we've been doing robotic operations on Mars for a while, but the pace of it, I think the pace could be increased if you have humans on site to essentially provide, I wanna say a rescue capability to the robotic surveyor maybe, if um, something was to go wrong, they could go out, but otherwise the robot is just out there um, performing say, a, repetitive type of task on its own, but we might be able to get it done and cover more area um, with the crew uh, supporting. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Ernie. And I know I took up some time going through that question twice. So let's go ahead and move on at this point and we will have additional time for discussion at the end of the session.